good afternoon ever again. Uh, um, Lean's just talked about metadata. I'm going to talk about standards for the actual biodiversity observations. Um, what we'll talk about is a little bit of background as to what kinds of biological data there may be. Um, what we need to consider about sharing marine biodiversity data. And then I'll talk in more detail about um, OBIS in particular, um, particularly what fields are mandatory when you're contributing data into OBIS and what additional data you can provide as well. And then if we've got time at the end of the day, I'll go through um, some common problems you might find with biodiversity data sets. Okay, well you're probably all aware that there are many different kinds of biological data arising from many different kinds of sampling methods and biological survey techniques. Um, they may be observing different variables and different components of biology. So up here we have density, biomass, body morphology, stomach content perhaps, um, and they may be sampling benthos, plankton, fish, birds, sea mammals, many different possibilities for the type of data that you're going to receive as a biodiversity data scientist. The way that, they, that sampling is done may mean that it relates to different types of geometries and that may depend on the sampling protocol. For instance, um, a scientist may present a data set to you with point observations, so a latitude and longitude where they've been carrying out grab samples um, or net samples in the water, plank uh, vertical plankton hauls perhaps. Um, or you may have a different kind of geometry to your data which uh, results from fishing net trawl perhaps, which has started from point A and gone over time to point B. Um, and then you may have observations over a very wide area, say people looking for sea mammals on the surface in a radius of a one or two kilometers perhaps. So you have to bear in mind those things, aspects to your data as well, that it's not just X, Y, it's sometimes over a bigger area. And of course, when you get the data, it can be in many different data formats, comma separated files of data, um, Excel spreadsheets, and anything else. I don't know. log files, <laughs> they all come your way. Uh, there's another one. I'm glad I didn't receive that one, but that's genetic data. <laughs> um, okay, so we get all of these different types of data from different surveys, different studies, and we want to share that data. Well, how do we know what everybody's talking about? How can we compare like for like? We need to have some kind of common standard that we can all relate the data to so that we can then compare it to each other and combine it if necessary. Um, and there is a common standard for describing biodiversity data and this, this standard is called the Darwin Core Standard. Um, it's a standard of terms so um, all rather like field names you might experience in the data set, but they call, in Darwin Core they're called terms and they also have vocabularies which refer to the values that you might actually find within a field. And there are standards for these as well. Um, you can find out more about Darwin Core using these particular links. Um, I'll just give you a quick look at um, the terms because there are an awful lot of them in Darwin Core. Um, if I just show you this particular page there. They have a quick reference guide to their, their terms. Um, and there are terms for, so this is a section of them, it'll go down the page. <laughs> All of these are terms and there are terms for describing at the record level the institution perhaps up here uh, I don't know whether you can see that, I'll go back over here, I'll put my phone, but the, there's, there's terms for describing the institution, the collection, the data set that it came from, um, when it 
the occurrence of a data, who was it recorded by, um, things like if it was a tagged individual, you can record the tag number against it in an individual ID field. Um, the sex, the life stage of an individual, uh, the location of it. There's a whole bunch of terms for describing the where here. So, so you understand that this would be sort of an Excel term, so access to the column. Well, there could be column headings. You could, yes. Um, when it comes to publishing data in OBIS, what you do is you map your fields of your data set to these terms. Okay? And we have a document um, that helps in doing that. Okay? But they are field headings, but they also have a meaning behind them. If you click on a, one of these terms, country, it gives a bit of a description against it. So it'll tell you what it asks for. So this one is the name of the country uh, or administrative unit in which the location occurs from. So all of these terms have a bit of bit more of a description behind them if you click on them, um, and sometimes best practices. There's a term called basis of record which tells you. Now let me just find it over here. Basis of record. This one has a vocabulary suggested with it. Basis of record basically tells you um, the nature of the record, how it was collected. Was it a human that collected it? Was it a machine that collected it? So if was it if it was a satellite or or um, an acoustic fish tag then it wasn't a human that detected that observation, it was a machine. And so you can record that in this particular field. So it was a machine observation. Um, we have a recommended vocabulary for that, you know, obviously, which I'll come to in a moment. So these terms uh, describe, help you describe the fields in your data and sometimes are prescriptive, or, well, not really, I wouldn't say prescriptive, but advisory, they give you a suggested vocabulary for them. Um, we have some suggested vocabularies in Orbis. But I'm not going to go through <laughs> too more in detail than that, just to say that this is the standard. You can find out more about it here. And it's the standard that Orbis is based on. Orbis is actually an extension of Darwin Core, we call it. And, that's, and it's an extension that's specifically for marine biodiversity. So it includes one or two things that they didn't think about initially, such as depth. <laughs> Okay. Okay, I never get that right. Okay, so Darwin Core, it's a body of standards. Um, it provides everybody a, a baseline for uh, describing their data sets. And the aim of it was to facilitate. Um, the sharing of biodiversity um, by minimizing the barriers to people using data and maximizing data's reusability. If everybody knows that the, what these things mean, then more people potentially can use that data. Okay. Within OBIS, OBIS uh, has a schema. Uh, what I mean by a schema is it's a set, it's a set of fields that we used to describe biodiversity data. Um, there is a, there's a document that I could, I'll provide that describes the current version of the OBIS schema, although it is changing constantly. Uh, we have a data task team um, and we look at including more Darwin Core terms into the OBIS data that we accept, um, although that does take quite a lot of discussion and debate. Um, so, what is the mandatory information that you need to provide to OBIS in terms of your biodiversity data set? Well, the mandatory information consists of the what, which is the scientific name of a species, and the where, the latitude and longitude. Originally, um, the OBIS project was I think Ward probably touched on this in his introduction, but it was from a project called the Census of Marine Life. The Census of Marine Life was interested in finding out what lived where in the ocean. That was all it was really wanted to find out about. Uh, and so our mandatory fields are based on this. So we require you to, to provide the scientific name of the species. So as Lean said earlier, not a code or anything like that, it's the scientific name. And when you provide that scientific name to OBIS, it needs to be the scientific name that it was recorded as 
originally. So if that's no longer a valid name, we don't care about that. We want to know the original name it was recorded as in the data set. Um, and in that way, we can track things back to the original data set. Then we have the latitude and longitude. Okay, the scientific name should always record, should always be to the best possible resolution that the person that identified the taxa to. So if it was identified to subspecies level, we want to know that information. We don't want just the species name, we want more than that if the data is there. Quite often though in data sets we don't have it to the resolution of spe species name. We are still interested in that information, we just need it recorded to at the best resolution that we can get. So even if it's, if it's a genus, that's great. If it's a family name, that's fine as well. As has been mentioned many times in this so far, um, worms, the World Register of Marine Species, forms the taxonomic backbone of Obis. Um, so that's where you should go if you're uncertain. You should consult worms first. Okay. And it has. we've also mentioned that sometimes some of the names in Obis um, are, are still not synchronized with worms. That's an ongoing process as well. Scientific name will be covered a bit more in Lean's presentation that follows this. Okay, now this seems very obvious to you, but latitude and longitude obviously need to fall within um, the bounds of our planet. Now, sometimes we might receive data sets with latitude and longitudes that are not within this. So, so the range of data needs to be from minus 180 longitude to plus 180, and from latitude minus 90 to, nine, to plus 90. We do receive data sets where we have coordinates that are not in those ranges, okay? <laughs> and you need to be aware of that, okay? Latitude and longitude need to fall within that grid. Okay. And when you supply latitude and longitude to OBIS, um, we expect the coordinates to be supplied in decimal coordinates. So that's... Um, Often you might, you might find data sets that have coordinates still provided in degrees, minutes and seconds. Okay. We want to standardise that to a decimal format. So you can do that using this formula down here, which is degrees plus minutes divided by 60 plus seconds divided by 3,600 gives you your decimal degrees. And after that conversion, all values, again, should be between those that expected range of minus 180 plus 180 minus 90 plus... 90. Um, when you provide the data to us, um, we use minus signs to indicate the minuses, but we don't put plus signs in front of the numbers when we have positive numbers. Okay, So that's another thing to look for. Okay, so best practices for the coordinates are convert them to decimal degrees, make sure they're within the correct boundaries. Um, the coordinate system that we use is this WGS84, so it's, it's latitude and longitude. Um, if, if you're not sure that that coordinate system has been used, because some surveys may use a different coordinate system, contact the data provider and get confirmation that it is latitude and longitude. If you're still not sure, you can plot the coordinates on a map, um, potentially using ArcGIS, and, and check that uh, they are correct. Check that they're not on the land, and check for potential outliers. By that we mean if your data is clustered in an area, an outlier is one that appears way, way off out in the distance. That indicates a, a data point that might be suspect. Um, and it's a good practice to document the coordinate system. If it's... Okay. So, um, if we have the scientific name, if we have the geographic location, they're the only essential components to OBIS. Um, they provide the user with information uh, on the biogeographic occurrence of a taxon. Doesn't sound like much. Okay. The only other essential information is to know about who. Who collected that record? Okay. And we have three fields in the OBIS schema for that. We have um, code, uh, institution code, collection code, 
and catalogue number. So the, the institution code is really, I don't think there's a, a standard necessarily uh, for that, where you can go and look up an institution code, not that I'm aware of. Um, but it's one that identifies the institution who, under which the data was collected. So it just can just be the entire, entire name of the institute, if necessary. And then the collection code might identify that data set within that particular institute. So let's say you have um, a database on fish and a database on mollusks. Each one of those would be a separate collection code. And then the catalogue number, that's really the, like the, the primary key, the identifier of a record that's in that institute's collection as well. Okay. So using all of those, we can get down to uniquely identifying every single record from an institute as well. Okay. So we've talked about the what, the where, and the who. Okay, that's more details about the institution code. Um, okay, a, a couple of examples about the institution code. Say perhaps that um, a researcher has collected this data and moved on to a different institute. What institute do I use as the institute code then? Well, the institution code should be the one, um, that of the institute that owns the data. I, let's say a PhD student was working um, at Ghent University here in Brussels, here in Belgium, sorry, <laughs> and... Uh, and he's moved on to somewhere else in the world. If the data was collected while he was working at that university, then Ghent University would be the data provider. Uh, sorry, the institution code still. Okay. It doesn't transfer just because somebody has moved uh, to a new institute. Okay, what if occasionally data sets get combined together into a larger database and then extracts taken from that. Um, if it was combined into a larger database, we suggest that um, it's the name of the institution associated with a larger database that is the institution code in that case. Okay. Okay, the collection code I've already talked about, it should be um, a text, alphanumeric text value that identifies a particular collection within an institute. Um, the thing to note is records within one collection must all be assigned the same institution code. They can't be different. Yeah? A data set consists, consists of all the data in that collection and all that uh, collection code must be the same. Okay. And the bottom suggestion is if an institute only has one data set, it can be the same as institute name, if you don't. Okay. And again, the catalog code number is the unique alphanumeric value that identifies the individual record, the primary key. Okay. So, so the latitude, sorry, the scientific name, latitude, longitude, and those three catalog number, sorry, institute code, catalog number, and collection code form the mandatory information for OBIS, that's only six fields of data. So if you have a data set with those six fields, you can send it to OBIS. Okay. But we're interested in more than that now. Okay. So you can prov the OBIS schema gives you the, the ability to provide a lot more information than that. And the most obvious next one is when. When did somebody... Um, sample when was that sample collected when was it taken okay so we have a number of fields in the OB schema um, for supplying date information um, some of them are a little bit more legacy now and we're moving on to supplying all the date information in a in one field called event date but I'll go through these originally so we have the year collected um, the year should be expressed as a number, but it's very important that it's expressed as a four-digit number, not a two-digit number. Um, because if you give us the, the number 72, we don't know whether it's this century or the last century. Um, where your event covers a range of values for a year, you can give us the midpoint of that range, for instance. Um, so let's say you had between... 72 and 74, we'd expect to see 73, I think, in that column. Um, then we've got the month, the month of the sample observation, um, 
and the day collected. So we're splitting out the date into three fields um, makes it very easy to understand. We can also supply the time of day um, and the time zone as well. Um, so we highly recommend including your date and time information. Um, it gives us a lot more scope to what we can do with the data. Now, those fields are a bit of uh, how it used to be done in the past. Um, all fields, five fields that you see there, we can supply in one field together. Um, in the OB schema, that's called event date. And that uses an international standard for dates, which is ISO 8601. So I want to talk about ISO 8601 in a little more detail, um, because it's really the preferred way to receive data to OBIS now. Um, ISO 8601, um, you won't just hear about in biodiversity, um, you'll hear about it everywhere across the globe. Okay? It's a ubiquitous global standard and it provides an unambiguous way of representing date and times. Uh, the idea is to avoid any misrepresentation of the date and time information. Um, many different countries have different styles for writing dates and times. This is one that we can use over everything. Okay. Now, there are different ways of representing dates in ISO 8601. We can have what's very familiar to us as a calendar date, a day, a year, month, day as numbers. Um, but we can have something called an ordinal date, which is a year, and then a day number within a year. So that would go between 1 and 366 in a leap year or 365 in a normal year. So you can define a date as that. Um, and you can also define in ISO 8601 um, a week date. So you can have a year, a week number, and a day within the week as well. Um, that's less common. Okay, so some examples of that. Um, a calendar date. Well, uh, first of all, I should explain ISO 8601 has two formats it has a basic format and then it has an extended format. The extended format hyphenates between certain fields that makes it a little bit easier to read. So OBIS, we would prefer to use extended format with the hyphens in place. It makes it easier to um, parse the information. So in ISO 8601, we have a calendar day. We have, and I shouldn't be doing it, <laughs> I'll come back over here. We have the years, 1985. The year comes first, and it always goes from left to right in terms of the resolution. It starts bigger down to smaller, so we have the year is the highest resolution. You can't see my mouse there. So 1985, the month and the day. So that's the 12th of April, 1985. And then it's separated out with hyphens there in the extended format. Um, ISO 8601 allows you to provide dates in reduced precision. That means we, we know it was collected in the year 1985, but we don't know when. That's still a valid format in ISO 8601, just by putting the year in there. So that would... Uh, so the second line down, my mouse is providing trouble. Again. Um, so if we know that, it's, that it was collected in 1985 and that's the only information we know, it's still valid to provide that as a date to us. Um, and that's the second one down. Okay, there. Um, when it comes to reduced precision in that we only know the month, well, we have to... We have to provide the date in extended format then. It's not allowed in ISO 8601 to provide it as this year, 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 month, month without a hyphen because it can lead to ambiguity in the interpretation of that. We might think that it's actually a, a day rather than a month. So you have to provide the hyphenated version there, the extended format, and that's why OBIS recommends using that extended format. Um, this is a, an example of an ordinal date. So it's the 102nd day within the year 1985 in both formats and a week date is note, denoted by the letter W um, within the string there so 1985 week uh, 15 day 5 a little bit easier to read with a hyphenated version again over here uh, and again you can cater for reduced precision if you only know it was in week 15 in 1985 that's valid so you can't see my mouse, but <laughs> you can see down here 
Um, it's another valid format. So ISO what ISO eight six zero one is pretty flexible um, in allowing us to define all these different ways of representing a date. It also allows us to represent time as well. So hours are on a, a zero a twenty four hour clock, which allows midnight to midnight, midnights uh, sorry minutes zero to fifty nine seconds zero to sixty. Um, that allows leap seconds, which is, I don't know what, too much about leap seconds, but for some people it's very important. Um, so you can also provide times as decimal fractions of an hour, minute or second. Uh, and it allows you to represent times in, in local time or in UTC time. I'll, some examples of that. Um, so an ISO, ISO, sorry, an ISO 8601 date the basic format in local time would be, so that's uh, 50 seconds, uh, 20 minutes, 23 hours, 11, 20, and 50 seconds uh, p.m. Um, that's how you represent it there. The extended format for times uses the colons between the different parts of the day. Um, you can represent a, the date as a decimal fraction. Um, so that's 50.5 seconds. It's valid to have a comma or a point, um, a decimal point uh, there. Um, and then if you represent dates in universal time code, that's denoted by a Z at the end of the string of text. If you want to uh, denote um, a local time offset, so the, the time, it would be the, the time offset from UTC, and that's represented by either a plus or a minus in the string below and then the the time zone offset at the bottom there. Okay. And of course you can combine date and times together into one field um, and you can the T in the string here so this is a, a year in extended format uh, the T in the middle just denotes the start of the time part of that string. Um, and you can do that for calendar dates, ordinal dates, and week dates, as you can show there. Um, so an extended format UTC date time, which is ideally what we'd like to see, <laughs> is uh, the year 2014, the month March, date 16, with a, the T below it down here, and then the hours, semi hours colon minutes comma sec seconds with the Z at the end to denote UTC time. So that's how uh, a full date and time stamp in UTC time would be represented. Ursula. Just, uh, if you... I know it's in March 2014. Yeah. And they've given me the time, but they haven't actually given me the day, like it's in March. So they haven't given you the day? No. Sorry. So the, yeah, I got confused as to what parts they'd given you and what they hadn't. Okay, yeah, they haven't given me the 16th or the 15th of March. Yeah. There. Okay, so it would be valid to just represent it as. 2014-03, you'd have to provide the dash because you only have it to the month resolution. Um, but then you could omit the 16 the, for the for the hours, and as long as if you've got a time portion as well, did you say? Yeah, you put the T in there and then put whatever you've got for the time okay. in as well. That's valid to do that. I just leave out the dash 16. Yeah, leave out the dash 16 essentially. Okay, now not every observation you'll have has an exact single point in time associated with it. Some of them sampling occurred over a period um, between two points in time. Now that's easy to represent in uh, ISO 8601 as well. It's simply the, the character to do that is provide both parts, so the start time and the end time, just separated by a slash, forward slash. It's simple as that. You can also provide um, a duration in ISO 8601, although we don't really encourage that in OBIS. We prefer 
to use this start and end time. But a duration, just so that you're aware of it, um, if you ever see one of these things, is uh, the representation of, representation of a duration begins with this letter P. Um, so you can provide uh, two, this example is two years, P two Y, so the two Y is two years, 10 M, 10 months, 15 days, and then the duration of the time, which still has the T in there. So the time is here, and then 10 H for 10 hours, 30 minutes, 20 seconds. That's how you represent a, a, um, a duration in ISO 8601. So, and you can also do that for weeks as well. P6W is, is a duration of six weeks. Um, so, well, it's the duration of potentially a, a sampling observation. So let's say. Um, Yeah, it depends on the. It depends upon the surveys. To um, so, I'm trying to think of a long duration sampling type of thing. Um, yeah, potentially. Uh, it's not bi biological, but it, um, let's say. Um, oh, it's hard to. I'm trying to think of an example, but it's it's hard to think. But let's say, yeah, okay. Let's say you say you have some kind of trap that you've that you've placed down in, in on the ocean on bed, and things crawl into it and fall into it. But you have no way of knowing exactly when and where something crawled into that trap. Um, then you could represent how long that trap was put on the bottom, and and available to capture organisms by this duration. Okay. Equally, you could just not not you could represent that time period by in this way. So by say just giving us the the start date and time potentially that it was the trap was activated and then it was closed. It's just two ways of of representing the same sort of information. We prefer this way, <laughs> even though it's more. Characters and long-winded. Long it's the same type of data that you're, you're representing. Okay. Um, so, even though it's not mandatory in the OB schema, we highly recommend that you provide date information. By giving us date, uh, it makes an observation possible to to include in temporal time-based analysis. Um, and the more information we know, the better resolution. There are more possibilities to include that record in, in detailed analysis. Um, so if you receive a data set where you don't have date information or it's not documented, please contact the data originator to see if, if that information is available because um, it's increasingly important. Um, in terms of the data that we accept, there's no restrictions on the minimum or maximum uh, values for the date uh, in Orbis. However, there are sensible bounds to that. Um, we wouldn't expect to receive date information in the future, for instance, and um, we wouldn't expect to receive um, date information beyond, let's say, the medieval period, so beyond 1300. I think the earliest observation we've currently got in Obis is about 1750, something like that. But there are, is, there is um, initiatives to analyze historical records and we wouldn't expect anything earlier than medieval period, though. Okay, um, okay so uh, best practices are confirmed that the year values are four-digit integers. Uh, we don't want any ambiguity in that. Use ISO 8601 um, and determine the maximum and minimum dates for your data set and cross-check that with the metadata as well that you're provided with. Okay. Um, Okay, that's just that's going over um, things we've already covered. Okay. Okay, so we discussed we've got the, the what, the scientific name, the where, the latitude and longitude, the who, the institution code, collection code, etc. And now we've got the when. All of that information gives us the ability to describe the presence of a taxon at a certain place on the globe, who observed it 
and at what point in time it was observed. So now we're doing pretty well, okay? But there's more we can ask, okay? How many did you see? That's the next thing. Um, so the OB schema can capture the how many's in a number of different fields. Um, we have um, the ability to capture, well, first of all, the ability to capture the amount that you observed. So if, you, if you're out at sea, you've, you've taken a sample, how many things did you observe or see? Um, we have a field called observed individual count here, which is the total number um, of taxa that were caught and are observed. There's another field, confusingly and very similarly named, called individual count. Um, and this is effectively um, to use to, to record, let's say you brought some back, some of that sample back to your laboratory or your museum. Um, so you preserved five specimens and brought that back. It would, that would be the, the field to record that information in. Um, of course, the how many might not be in terms of numbers of an individual. It might be in biomass. So biomass can be recorded in observed weight. Um, but numbers of individuals are not that great of value unless we know the sample size that they came from. So we can record the sample size as well in a column called sample size. Okay. Now, when it comes to uh, def recording these values for how many individuals observed, um, some surveys only give us the presence data, so they don't include quantities uh, or, or numbers of individuals. Some do include abundance of biomass data. So what if we only have presence data, um, to, i.e. we saw it, but we don't know in what quantity? Um, presence data would be indicated by an empty or null uh, value in the observed individual count field. Okay, but you may have records where you do have values for that. So in a data set where you've got both, um, you would include a null value in observed individual count field. Um, beware, scientists have different ways of documenting that it was just present. Okay? So they can actually put a number in there, um, but it means that nothing was present. So you may see values such as minus 1 or minus 99. That means... Um, we didn't see it, or, it uh, or we didn't count the number of, of uh, individuals. Um, you should check with your data provider if you see strange values like this to um, determine um, is it representing a presence or something else. Um, those types of values we need to be replaced by an empty field, a null field, before it's submitted to OBIS. Another caveat of this is absence. So if somebody went out into the field and was looking for something and they definitely didn't find it, and they want to record that absence, um, that would be indicated by a zero value in that observed individual count field. But the actual abundance counts of a taxon are to be filled in as positive numbers in the observed individual count field. Um, as discussed, that so we have observed individual count and individual count. The individual count field should only be filled in if it concerns any specimens that were collected and transferred back to the laboratory to serve as reference in the, uh, collections. So, for an example, both fields can be filled in. Uh, let's say you uh, counted 165 individuals in the field and five were preserved. You could do it that way. We wouldn't expect to see the individual count greater than the observed individual count. That would be a, a check you could do. And again, just a reminder, if you record this observed individual count, we really do need an indication of the sample size. Without sample size, it has very little value. And the combination of those two fields, sample size and observed individual count, allows us to start to tr attempt to make comparisons between uh, samples uh, from different surveys, although it's still a difficult thing to achieve. Um, okay, if biomass is given, we can store that in the observed weight field. Um, now, Obis has a standard that that biomass should be expressed as kilograms, but it's very, very rarely the case. 
uh, that is expressed as kilograms. Um, it can be expressed in many other units, so we recommend that you store the actual biomass units um, in a note in the OBIS notes field. So we have a notes field where you can uh, supply additional information. So we suggest that you would uh, put something in there like unit of biomass, grams, ash free dry weight. That's what that stands for. Okay. Uh, an example of the things that you might see in sample size, well, we've looked in OBIS and uh, revealed that there's a very diverse array of uh, sample size indications, such as like the number of individuals per square meter, and it's represented there as a hash for the number of individuals per square meter, cells per cubic meter, number per square meter, as a hash, individuals per meter squared, number per cubic meter. Um, we still need to record this, but the interpretation of that and the standardization of that uh, is something that the data task team needs to work on um, because it makes it's still very difficult to compare between samples because you're comparing against different volumes, different metrics. Um, in an attempt to standardize um, to some degree though, um, we recommend that the units that you use to describe your sample size in use the international system of units, the SI units to express measurement. Um, so that can be consulted more, um, there's a good page on Wikipedia for, for the international system of units. Um, according to the ISR international system of units, the correct spelling for things like meter is not, is meter and not meter, so the English not the American style. Um, and they have uh, specifications for how you uh, describe surface area and volume measurements. So the style is meter with a, a superscript 2 for squared and superscript 3 for cubic meter. Um, liter, interestingly, is not part of the international system of units. The, the unit there would be 1 cubic decimeter here, dm cubed. Um, However, it's often used and we suggest keeping it and spelling it in the American style. So, <laughs> we, it seems like our data test team still has a way to go, but that's our, our um, suggestion. Um, and we don't really want to see the, the hash signs for number of, in, like as in number of individuals, please just use the abbreviation individual. So, they are some, this is um, moving along in an attempt to standardize how we describe sampling effort. Um, Regarding sessile species, because the way we record them is percentage cover of a yes. measured area. That's not in there. Um, no, it's not in there. Yeah, put it. You put it in the notes and say your sample size was this area and the percentage cover was this much. But in theory, you could convert that into a into a surface area volume if you know know both those metrics. Fifty percent of a area, you could you could convert that to a unit. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, additional fields on the what. So, uh, and this, this is actually on the how. Uh, the basis of record, we have to, uh, to help us specify uh, how an observation was made. Um, and we also have additional fields to describe the where. Um, which is called coordinate precision, and I'll just go on to them. The how, um, so the basis of record field describes what information the record is based on, and I talked about Darwin Core having vocabularies before. We have a suggested vocabulary for this field, which describes basically how the record was collected. So um, our vocabulary is, it says O for an observation, so this is like a human uh, a human visual observation of a species. So it's a scientist going into the field and, and sampling. Um, S is for a specimen in a collection or museum. Uh, so that's kind of a, a, a special case um, that we know that we have a specimen in a collection or museum. OBIS is still interested in, in those uh, records of occurrence of a species. It's, people use OBIS to look up where they can find specimens. Um, L is a collected living organism, so that's like, not necessarily in the field, but it's something that's been collected and it's still alive. 
Um, so it's been planted in an arboretum or a, a museum garden or something like that, but it's, it's not where it was found originally. Yeah. Uh, P is for a photograph. Um, G is a bit unusual. It's uh, for a germplasm or seed. So if somebody collected seeds, um, we could record that. Um, and D is derived from literature. So we may not, the observation may not have been made now, but it's been documented in the, in the historic literature. Um, and we can record that basis of record in that way. Um, okay. So most of the records in OBIS are associated with O, S, and L, which is observation, specimen in the museum, or a collected living organism. The other ones are not that uh, relevant. They're usually primarily by botanists uh, and found in other collections like GBIF. Um, so again, a best practice suggestion here, if, you're gonna supply, if you supply this information, is to reformat the record information to the codes that we have in OBIS. Um, if you're not unsure of how the records were collected, please contact the data provider and ask them. Um, and those values need to be completed in uppercase. Okay. So more information about the what now. Um, so the, man the, the mandatory information about the what is the scientific name. Um, but there are additional fields in the OBIS schema that you can use to help us out, and they are the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus um, fields. So these are text-based fields. We highly recommend supplying the kingdom, at least, that the organisms come from. And this can be quite important because we may have unknown species. So there's a species, say, here we have a species, Chondrocanthus. Uh, it's an unknown species, but it turns out that um, that Chondrocanthus uh, occurs in the plant kingdom and in the animal kingdom. Okay, so if you provide us with the kingdom, we'll know which one of those you're talking about. Another example um, would be Alcyonium. Um, if this is an unknown species, well, if you provide the phylum, um, we know that Alcyonium is a synonym of what's now accepted as Tethia. Um, but there are other phyla with the same thing, Alcyonium in it, the phylum Cnidaria. So the more information you can give us about these, it helps us to reduce the ambiguities to the name and helps us to narrow it down to what it really is. Um, okay. Um, here's another one. So the scientific name, Albion. Um, okay, it's actually um, a parasitic uh, crustacean, um, but it also is a name of a sponge as well, which is now accepted as love one. So... Um, giving us the the, uh, is that the is that the class crustacea or periphera, we would know which one you meant. Okay, so that's important. Um, also, uh, we have a field for the scientific name author. Um, I guess the most famous one of those is Linnaeus, perhaps. <laughs> but the scientific name author can be also be valuable information um, to help us narrow down the name. So. Um, Okay, so that's extra details on the what. Um, we can also get extra details on the where. Um, so not just the latitude, longitude, positions. We can You can provide us with things like the continent or ocean. So really in terms of the marine data, that's the ocean in which the specimen was collected. Um, the country, if it's in the waters of a particular country, you can give us the country name. Um, the state. Uh, the county and the, and the locality. The locality is really like a local name of the place. We can, we're can we interested in all of this information. It helps us, it helps people to, uh, to get extra details on the where. Okay, and it can also help us to confirm the latitude and longitude positions that you give us as well. So if for some reason those, are, those have been uh, changed or transposed around perhaps, then it helps us to, to to identify those types of problems. Okay, um, again, more information on the what. Uh, we can record the gender of the the organism, and this is another area where we have a suggested vocabulary, um, which is a, a list of values. So, um, gender doesn't necessarily mean male and female in the marine world. There's lots of in-betweens. Um, 
So, of course, we've got male and female, but we've got hermaphrodite. Uh, we don't know. We couldn't determine. Indeterminate, uh, we really don't know because we didn't examine it. <laughs> and then something that's somewhere in the middle, transitional, um, used for sequential hermaphrodites. There's taxa that change from male to female over time. Um, and then some can be both, okay? um, both male and female. Okay, so it's an it's an interesting one. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a suggested um, vocabulary for gender, and again, they're all uppercase values. Um, if you can format your data with those in, again, that's additional useful information. Um, you know, sex ratios in populations can be quite interesting to to analyze as well. Okay, um, the where. I've talked about those, so the, ge the schema fields for geographic locations, we've got latitude and longitude are mandatory, uh, continent, ocean, country, state, province, con county, locality. One I haven't touched on is coordinate precision. Um, what we represent coordinate precision is if, we, if we're not sure, um, say um, a sample was taken um, in a transect, for instance, uh, we can represent that transect by its midpoint, and we can then describe the ends of the ends of the or the, the length of the transect or the as the coordinate precision. Um, so, if we're representing all the organisms on our transect as as one point, um, but they may have been found anywhere along that transect, perhaps, and we're not sure of the exact place, we can say that it was the midpoint of the transect. But we need to know. Um, then what were the precision of that measurement is? So we'd have to we supply the distance in meters um, of basically uncertain area, so the edge of where you would say um, it was sampled from. Okay, so that's what the coordinate precision means. Um, okay. Um, other things to note about geographic locations: um, there are some places you can go for recommended names of oceans. One of those is the NASA Global Change Master Directory, but more recently is the Marine Regions Org that is hosted at VLIS. Um, GCMD is available there. Um, the problem with GCMD is it doesn't give you uh, a nice way of actually looking at the areas that the names represent. Um, if you go to Marine Regions Org, um, which is the Vlies Marine Gazette, you can find lists of the geographic names of places and you can also see them as a on a map as well. So it's a, a bit more uh, it's a bit more user friendly perhaps to use um, the Marine Regions Org site. Um, so we would recommend that you use a name from one of those two uh, registers of, of names. Um, you can also find uh, things like the EEZ names on the uh, Marine Regions site, and it's that those EEZs and EEZ names form the base of the layers actually in Orbis as well. Um, okay. Oh, the coordinate precision explained again. <laughs> okay. So it, it's a coordinate precision an estimate of how how tightly the locality was specified in the latitude and long and just to reiterate, it expresses a distance in meters that corresponds to a radius around your latitude and longitude point. Um, so it gives you a kind of circular area. If you don't know what the coordinate precision is, um, and it can't be estimated or it's not applicable, just include it as, as a null field for those values where you don't know. Okay. Now, again, the where. So we've talked about latitude and longitude, on a, but things occur at different depths in the ocean as well. So we have to um, be able to provide depth, and that can be stored in three fields. <clears throat> We've got minimum depth, maximum depth, and depth range. Um, so um, let's say we're sampling, and we start just sampling from a single depth point. Um, you would provide the depth um, in, as the same value in both the minimum and maximum depth field. We need those both filled in. Okay. If it's a depth range between two depths, then you need to fill in the minimum and maximum depth fields, obviously, with the values of the range, minimum being the shallower, maximum being the deeper. 
Um, we record depth as positive numbers below the sea surface. So we, depth isn't like 10 meters isn't minus 10, depth me, 10 meters is 10. Um, okay, and also it's, it seems very obvious, but if a, a pelagic sample has been taken in mid water, we want to know the depth of the sample in the water column, not the depth of the seabed at that point in time. Um, in all cases, the minimum depth should be smaller than or equal to the maximum depth. So there's a, a rule there uh, that you can check in your data sets. Okay. Um, if you provide minimum and maximum values, then the range can be calculated and shouldn't be entered. Um, there's no need to enter it. Okay. Um, one other thing to note, though, is... Uh, for historical reasons, the OB schema contains certain fields from Darwin Core that we had to have in the OB schema uh, to make it compatible with Darwin Core. One of those is a field called elevation. Um, we really don't want you to use that. Okay, that's talking about altitude. Um, the only reason you might want to use it, let's say um, you have a data set that's mixed. So you might have a fishes data set, and it might well be from the ocean, and might include lakes as well. Um, okay, so then you may need to use both the depth and the elevation fields. Okay. So the depth field would then relate to the water surface. If it was a lake, you would record the depth relative to the surface of the lake. The elevation would be the elevation in terms of meters of altitude at which the lake was occurring. Yeah. Um, but if you're talking about things that are just in the ocean, the, ele the elevation is not relevant. Okay, okay. so de for depth, their best practice suggestions are that it has to be expressed in the unit meters, and it's a positive value where the sample is collected beneath the water surface. If it's a single point depth observation, you put the depth in the same minimum depth and maximum depth fields. Uh, if it's a collected between two depths, the minimum and maximum are obviously the shallower and deeper depth, respectively. That's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah? Uh, for us, for example, as the ocean has had the museum, we have uh, lack of information regarding to some kind of species, sea species, because we, we don't know at what time they were collected. Yeah. So we have some kind of few, few information about that, that collection. Uh, we can, for example, here, we, I, I think that most of the things, we don't have the depth. Yeah. Because the species that has been collected during so the last 20 or 50 years. Yeah, yeah. So we don't know who collected them, where they collected and in which condition they collect that, that species. Yes. How we can put that information in our piece? Well, it's still, if you, as long as you've got the six valid fields, so as long as you've got a scientific name, a latitude and a longitude, yes. and you can provide details of the, that institution code, <laughs> uh, collection code, um, and I can't remember, <laughs> I keep forgetting the sixth one, but th those, three f those three additional fields that tell us who collected the data, then it's still a valid data set for OBIS. It does, we don't, you know, depth and, and time are not mandatory. Yeah, we just, you know, at a minimum with that information, we can map out the, the biogeographic extent of a taxa. It's not a problem, no. You know, we, it's still valuable information. With that information, we can map the rough uh, biogeographic distribution of a species, which is what the original OBIS project, the Census of Marine Life, set out to do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is just to say that we do have a free text field in the OBIS schema, which is a notes field. Within that notes field, you can supply additional information. Um, about a particular record that helps anybody interpreting that record. It's just a free text field. 
Okay, so some examples of what may have come in that field. Um, coordinates come, this is just a note, I don't understand what it means. So coordinates come from Vlimar, and approximate coordinates of the exact sampling location isn't known. So it's just to say for that record, the coordinates are approximate. Another example might be to include the AFIA ID um, of the taxa in that field. Okay. Now, with many of the fields in OBIS, um, we recognize that data doesn't just come in as a, a single point in time or a single place. So there are these ability to specify data ranges. Um, and there are several fields in the OBIS schema uh, where we have start and end versions of the same field. So we might have latitude and longitude. And therefore, we have a start latitude and a start longitude and a start uh, and an end latitude and an end longitude so that you can provide a range of values in those fields. Um, um, so we felt that it was important in, uh, as an obese uh, body to be able to specify a range for a location or a time. Um, for example, a trawl might have taken over a line transect and it's better expressed as a start and end latitude rather than a single point with a coordinate precision. Um, similarly, old specimens that might exist uh, may only be labelled with the dates of a cruise and not the actual date that they're taken on. Um, so we want to know that the sample was taken sometime within the span of that cruise. Um, so for those type of reasons, we include the start and end fields in the OBIS schema. Um, but uh, to be compliant with the Darwin core, we also had to uh, can to include the original single field as well. Okay. Okay, so um, let's give a couple of examples of expressing our position in the OB schema. So um, in case one, if we have all latitude and longitudes as a point locations, then it's very easy. We just fill the coordinates in in the latitude and longitude fields. Um, in case two here, uh, we have a start latitude and an end latitude given. Um, well, they have to be filled in in the respective start latitude and end latitude, start longitude, end longitude fields. So that's four fields rather than two. Um, then it has to be decided what you put into the latitude and longitude fields. Because remember, those latitude and longitude fields are mandatory fields in the OB schema. So actually you have to provide six fields there not four. Okay. Um, so, place latitude and longitude in the fields based upon the average of the start and the stop fields. So the average of the start latitude and end latitude. So add them together, divide by two. And make sure that you fill in the coordinate precision in that case as well. Okay. The second option, it says, is to populate the fields using just the start or end position. Um, we would, I would prefer the first option, um, is to calculate the average of the two positions and fill in a coordinate precision value. Okay. Case three, some samples are point locations and some were taken over distance. Well, you can use the same method uh, described before, so fill in the point locations as latitude and longitudes and the ones that were taken over distance in the same data set you would have to fill in those start, end fields and the latitude and longitude field as well. Okay. Um, there are also in the OB schema, just to make things more complex, but they're not mandatory, um, there are uh, start and end coordinate precision fields as well. So. <laughs> You can specify roughly where it, the transect started and roughly where it ended if you're not sure. Okay. Um, okay. Um, an example of that, let's say we have a, a one kilometer trawl recorded and they were using the GPS to document their start and end positions and the measurement error is about 10 meters. Um, but let's say that they went around in a circle so the start and end position is about the same. How are we going to express that? Well, we will document the start and end coordinate precision as being 10 because 10 meters is what the GPS is uh, recording it as. And then the coordinate precision is slightly different. It would be the center point of the whole sampling area where the trawl was taken. Um, so it would be the, the, 
the midpoint, the center point, and then you'd have to express, if it was a one kilometer circular transect, the coordinate precision would be 500 meters, because that's the radius from the center point of that transect. So it gets complicated. <laughs> No, but that's how you have to explain the area that it was taken from. Okay, so how are we doing for time? Uh, 15 minutes to the end of the day? Okay, uh, a few things that, as data managers, uh, some of these things will be blatantly obvious, you've probably come across some of them, but a few common problems with data sets. Okay, uh, common problems with metadata. Well, the biggest one of that is it doesn't exist at all. Okay. And uh, it does happen, none has been created. So it's important uh, that you do provide metadata for the reasons Lean has already said. Um, in OBIS, um, we have a number of mandatory metadata fields. Um, we need a data title, we need an abstract. So this is just like you'd find in a data paper, short description of the data set, a citation. So we want your data sets to be cited correctly so you so the owners and the data providers get the correct um, acknowledgement for providing that data so it's very important that you provide us with the citation that you'd like um, otherwise you're missing out on the credit you deserve for, for providing that data um, usage um, where's where's ward ward have you covered this yet or are we going to talk about this later about usage Okay, usage really describes the, ter the terms on which you're making your data available. Now, ideally, we'd like it available, you know, uh, completely open, but some people put different restrictions on it. They say it's only available, but only available for, for non-commercial use. And, and there are diff many different types of that ward. We'll go into that. Um, and also very important to have a, a, some point of contact, a person, a name, an email address, or a telephone number, um, so that we people can get in touch with the originating data provider uh, if they need more information or wish to collaborate with them. That, that one is a huge problem in Africa because of the high staff turnover on, in institutions. Yes. So how, because most, well at least our institution doesn't have a general info dot, you know, info at email. So if I put my thing there and I resign tomorrow, <laughs> uh, it is a dilemma. Um, and it, it's a huge dilemma because, I mean, you know, the, of course, I mean, if somewhere you probably have the institution information yes. there. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think there's a solution because you can't. Not necessarily. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it's hard to make a recommendation there. I, it'd be a general, I would recommend perhaps a general, if your institute has a general point of contact. At all, not, not email wise. Not email wise, no. Um, <laughs> well, you can put. I think you in that case you don't have to provide an email. You could just provide your institution's address yeah, and, and general phone system. number. The phone, of course, yeah. The phone number. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, as far as, well, I, I've got the idea that institutes these days are providing permanent email addresses to their students so that they carry them with them for life. But it, it doesn't happen everywhere, of course. I mean, um, we were just three weeks without yeah. email and everything's gone deleted. So that's the reality in yeah, the yeah. Oh, you, uh, I mean, it's potential you could set up a, like a Gmail account or something like that. It's, you know, the, it stays with you. But uh, to be safe, I would something more like the institute's address and the telephone number. But that, even telephone numbers change. Yeah. Or link to Ocean Expert at Bureau. Yeah. The record of the data Ocean Expert. Yeah. Yeah, but even there, I mean, I just um, got a request from Luca all the emails that bounced from our house of people left about six years ago. They were still on. And I, because, I mean, I, if I ever resign, I'll probably forget. Yeah. And they go to different fields. You know, they go to mining and then leave. Yeah. 
Well, the idea is to have something at least. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, you, the institute yeah. train is in, I think, the yeah. yeah, because you probably still contact an institute and they would have a record of you working there and might be able to say, oh, yeah, they moved on to this and place or that place. Yeah, but it's, at least it gives you a starting point to track that person down. If you have nothing in there, then you've got no way of knowing where to start. It's also a bit of your own res responsibility eh, that you mm -hmm. contact the uh, OBIS or whatever that is serving your data to update it when, whenever you leave or uh, whenever you retire. So we also yeah. we don't live forever. Eh? <laughs> that, that's still got to be addressed, that problem, yeah. Okay. Um, It just just ha some point of contact or some some way that allows somebody to get in touch with the data provider or at least get on the route to doing so uh, is is very beneficial. Uh, Lean's already talked about the given examples of titles and abstracts, perhaps that are too generic. It's important to make sure that your metadata is descriptive and and very, quite detailed. Um, okay, problems with occurrence data. Um, missing mandatory fields is the biggest problem. Without those man six mandatory fields, we cannot take your data and load it into Obis. Okay, so you must look for uh, no latitude and or longitude. Okay, because sometimes you might be provided with one or the other, but we can't make a coordinate out of just one. We need both. Um, no scientific name and nothing in the institution code, collection code, or catalog number. Well, I would suggest then you, you generate your own for that data set. If it's if it's just in an Excel spreadsheet, uh, just provide the row number in the Excel spreadsheet. It's as a, it's just a unique identifier. Oh, Lean's got something to say about that. Entry, so it's per single observation record. It's it's an ID for a record. Well, the whole Dorian Door was designed for museum collections. The GBIF, GBIF started up with museum collections. So there you have institution collections called a Gallup number. Every specimen in the bottle of the jar is a entry. So yeah, but if you do report monitoring on a monthly basis, in your database, you will not have a. You've got your, your station and your dates and everything, but of course, you can probably create one that's very long with every time the species name or code or whatever. Well, if you're in the database, your observation would go into a data table, and typically that would have a unique primary key on it. So you could, even if it's across multiple fields in the data, you could concatenate those together, and that would be your unique yeah, record identifier. Yeah. Well, that's fine. That's fine. You know, as long as that's what we're looking for, just some some means of. Yeah, yeah, we can have a look. We can have a look and help you out. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, so moving on. Uh, so the missing mandatory. If if a mandatory field is missing, the data cannot be loaded into Obis. Okay. Uh, some more problems. Um, data, when it's present, is not in the correct format. So we might have, uh, I, uh, this is a bit ambiguous, but let's say we have scientific name and author present in the same field. Um, in the OBI schema, you've got the ability to split those two things out. It would be better if you split those two things out. Um, I still need to check whether that's still, uh, whether you can have it valid in Darwin Core, but in the OBI schema, it's better to split those things out. Um, other things would not be considered a correct format if a, a longitude contains like the word east or the letter E, for instance, or the or the same for west or north south. Okay, we we don't want that in there. Um, we want it to be a minus 
a minus or plus uh, integer between 180 plus minus 180 plus 180 you know the rest um, but things like having east and west in there that's not valid okay um, dates are not provided in an ISO 8601 format okay so this is not an ISO 8601 format okay the month here is French for February and a French abbreviation for February um, that's not valid this one is not valid either because the year here is 04 okay it's not a four digit number um, we have no idea what century that relates to okay um, so um, so things to look out for are those kind of things that, that month as names um, incorrect depths um, so this isn't a depth that's 200 meters above the surface of the ocean if it's put in the depth field that uh, 12,500 why isn't that a valid depth it's deeper than the deepest point of the ocean yeah the deepest point of the ocean is uh, about what, challenger deep 10,800 meters something like that um, so that's an impossible value for a depth uh, and this one isn't valid here this 1.1 kilometers because depth needs to be specified in meters not kilometers um, again incorrect units um, so using kilometers instead of meters in a field degrees minutes and seconds instead of decimal degrees that wouldn't be valid um, and then uh, incorrect decimal degrees so down here none of those are decimal degrees that's all in degree minutes and seconds um, and then we get into problems where we have uh, inverted or transposed values values in the wrong column a common one of that is latitude and longitude get swapped over um, now it's hard to detect latitudes that have happened because the range of latitudes goes between minus 90 and plus 90 uh, so that fits into the longitude range of values if it's the other way around you can sometimes see that you've got these bigger extreme values that uh, help you to track that one down um, that if you plot that data out it can manifest itself sometimes in easy to see so if let's say we had uh, data from again off the coast of uh, uh, so around Madagascar for instance if that was transposed you'd see that data set appearing in the um, northeastern Atlantic yeah um, so you can try and plot the data out uh, which show things like that um, another common thing is that subsample size is greater than sample sizes so in the OB schema we've said that we wouldn't expect to see records with values in the individual count greater than the observed individual count because that individual count is supposed to represent a subsample of that sample other things that may happen a month and day field swapped around so you may notice those by um, you know, a month with the values um, greater than 12 uh, in it yeah before we move to the next yeah, yeah. that um, Indian Ocean Taxa in the Atlantic I mean that's one thing I picked up now because of our northern Namibian and Golan area under sample that in, you know it, it says it doesn't occur there but it's yeah. obvious, but you know if you look at distribution it occurs in the same latitudes in the Indian Ocean and it's both tropical systems so yes I mean that's one thing is it in a misidentification is it an undescribed species and I mean I'm not a taxonomist so I sort of <laughs> yeah well again it's a, it's a it reason just make notes of what and say you know you think it's this one however yeah but if you if you can go back to the original data provider the person that collected the data go back to them no, and I'm check collecting it myself, you're collecting it I yourself oh okay <laughs> 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 oh boy Okay, this is taking a little longer than I thought, but uh, um, values that include the com. So, in a data set, you have often have your data separated into columns and they may have a character separator between them. So, comma separated value files are fields separated by commas. But if a value of 
that's in there, let's say they've recorded their latitude and longitude in a comma separated value file and they've used commas rather than decimal points. When you process that file, that's going to throw out your columns by an extra step because you have an additional uh, comma in there. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, and then uh, a common thing to do is in data files is to denote text files with the use of quotation marks. Um, and sometimes data files use those as qualifiers to delimit uh, fields as well. So you just have to be very careful that um, you don't have these delimiters um, in those files as well uh, that are representing real information. Okay. Then we have things like values outside expected or, or possible ranges. So the, obviously latitudes and longitudes we've already talked about. Um, and then, but also outside the scope of the data set, for instance. So let's say we have marine turtles of Kenya and that includes records in the Mediterranean or something like that. That's, that's uh, one where we might question the validity of some of the data in there. Um, things to look out for are points on land. Um, again, plotting your data can, can uh, reveal those. Uh, dates in the future are impossible. We can't go sampling in the future yet. Um, dates too far in the past. For instance, think about the data set. Were people scuba diving and carrying out video transects in the year 1894? I don't think so. Um, months outside 1 to 12, days outside 1 to 31, and then uh, impossible dates. These are quite common. I've seen many of these. Uh, so uh, the 31st of September 2007 doesn't exist. Okay, September only goes to 30th, and the 29th of the 2nd, 2001, that's a, a leap year, but it wasn't a leap year. Okay, so keep an eye out for those kind of things. Um, and a nasty one is um, character encoding issues. Um, so data gets passed between different files and read by different applications. Windows applications like Excel or Word don't necessarily... Uh, they may even insert uh, characters, uh, like more Microsoft specific characters than uh, in other applications. So you have to look out for um, characters that when you open them in one application and in, in another, they, the characters don't appear the same. Common things are uh, like uh, in, in other alphabets other than English, so this characters with accents or special markers you know, over the top there, they're not like uh, the core set of characters so they are represented in other ways in other systems um, data sets with lots of zero values in sometimes um, people represent empty values as zeros in data sets um, so that may leave you scratching your head a bit should they be zeros or should they be nulls um, a problem that we see sometimes is that we have a a disproportionately large number of observations either along the equator or the prime meridian because where uh, coordinates uh, wasn't, wasn't recorded they filled it in with zeros so let's say we have a, an X coordinate but not a Y coordinate they might have put a zero in there so we seem to have sometimes a concentration of records uh, in lines you know along meridia um, we need to look for that um, Another one, data sets that actually have the word null in them, okay? Um, where it, the null value in the database has been represented as text. Um, null really means no value, okay? So there shouldn't be anything there. Okay? I have a problem with that one for, if I just think of my data, because of, if, if you punch your data, you want to do calculations. If you've got several subsamples and you've got one species, you have to, if you, if you work out the average abundance in, you know, in these five subsamples, you, if you leave it empty, it's different to having a, a zero in. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably where that comes from. Yes. You know, because the data is extracted from databases that are used for calculations. Yeah, it can be. Um, Okay, values, uh, next one is values containing a data type that's not expected. So you get text in where you um, expect numeric columns or date columns. So the example, as I've showed before, is months and names and not numbers. Uh, and they present in different languages. Uh, and then again, numbers in text columns. So 
data can be extracted from a database and it can rather than looking up a, a text-based value in a lookup table it can provide you just with the ID of the record that's there so um, well, I've had data sets where supplied where we were expecting text in these continent these ocean names or water body names and uh, it was just a number well, we didn't know what that was uh, and then finally uh, I guess one of the things uh, not everybody knows about Darwin Core and OB Schema, so the, the columns that you get in your data set um, may be different, named quite differently to anything you might see in OB Schema or Darwin Core. Um, everybody's got a different way of naming their columns in their data set, so it's important to understand what the column is um, if there's any ambiguity there. So again, talking with the data originator um, is essential in those circumstances. Okay. Thank you for listening, everybody. Any questions?